Let's begin to worship the Lord and let's open up with a word of prayer. Uh, God, in the name of Jesus Christ, I ask you, dear God, just to be with us in everything that we do. I ask you, dear God, for you to be glorified. I ask you, Lord, to be honored. I ask you, dear God, for your presence to, to, uh, just come in to the various different places as we look around the world, uh, across the United States and wherever it may be. I ask you, Lord, for your presence just to be with us, uh, that you'll begin to speak to hearts. You'll begin to speak to lives. Uh, you'll all draw us closer to you. Uh, we ask you, dear God, for your presence and your power to be with us uh, during this time that we share together. In Jesus' name, amen. As we prepared for today's class, as we prepared for today's class, there's a couple different things that was happening. There are some things that God specifically laid on my heart that I felt like I needed to share before I introduced Dr. Edith. Um, there's different things that are coming down the pipe. If you guys don't know, this summer class is something that's unique to SUM. It is something that we've done differently this year. We're offering this classes for our students so that they could take an extra class in the summertime. For two different reasons. Number one, to lighten their load during the year. And two, to inspire them to seek the Holy Spirit and to seek his presence in their lives and their ministry. And when we decided to do that, we also decided that we would make this open for anybody else, anybody in the world that wanted to come to visit. Now, whether or not you all realize this or not, we had 400 people that signed up and has come and visit this year. We've only got about 60 students that are taking this for credit, but we had over 400 people that just signed up just to sort of be a part of this. And uh, we welcome you. And I'm talking to those people that are outside of our class right now. We welcome you being a part of this here. We're glad that you're a part. And we wanted to take just a short time in this last class section just to tell you about SUM Bible College and what we're doing. So at this point right now, I want you guys to take a look at uh, this, this video. And then we're going to have a friend of, of SUM, one of our... A breakout session leaders come and talk to you just for one second. There are 8 billion people in the world today. 5.5 billion do not know Christ as their Savior. 1.8 billion have never heard the gospel. How will they know him unless they have heard? And how will they hear unless the called are sent? You heard the call of God and you answered, but there's so many distractions, so many different paths one can take. How do I answer God's call in life and prepare myself? SUM Bible College and Theological Seminary has launched its new online flexible delivery model anytime, anywhere. Eight accredited degrees equipping the church to fulfill the Great Commission are available for undergraduate and graduate students anytime, anywhere. Ministry degrees empower those in called to full-time vocational ministry while marketplace degrees provide a solid educational foundation to resist a culture that is hostile to a biblical worldview. Students worldwide can receive their theological education on a flexible schedule using high definition, engaging videos that are broken into three segments, learn, grow, and serve. Supported by comprehensive, downloadable notes, student discussion boards, and small group meetings with their professors. Our unique mission statement at SUM is to equip leaders globally by providing an affordable theological education, combining academic instruction with practical hands-on ministry and personal mentorship. Our goal is to raise spirit-empowered five-fold ministry leaders to be instruments of change in their communities. Our partnership model enables denominations, parachurch organizations, and churches to offer these programs right in their local context. These learning cohorts make your church the center for Christian education in your community. You might be concerned about the cost of college. Our commitment to provide affordable education has led to the new donation-based grant which guarantees that students will graduate with absolutely no debt. We look forward to connecting with you to answer any questions about our programs and partnerships. SUM, anytime, anywhere, for anyone who is serious about their calling. 
Well, good morning, SUM. My name is Brendan Bagnell. I'm the Director of Missions here. And first of all, I want to say thank you for being part of our summer experience here, talking about world revivals. You know, as you saw there in the video, our passion at SUM is to raise up a new generation of kingdom leaders all around the world. And no doubt, over these last few weeks, as you've listened to the stories of revival and those who were catalysts in revival, the Lord stirred your heart. And there's no doubt that some of you, in that stirring, the Lord is also calling. And here's the thing about revivals. Revivals are not just things of the past. They're things of the present and things of the future. There's no doubt God is going to do great things yet to come here in our world, in our time, for His glory and the advancement of His kingdom. And to do that, He's going to need some new catalysts, some new sparks of revival, and that could be you. We believe that the Lord is raising up history makers and nation shakers in Jesus' name. And if you feel that call, if you feel that draw, we want to help you fulfill that calling. Over these next few weeks, we'll send you some emails about SUM and how we can help equip you to fulfill your calling in the kingdom. Again, we're so glad that you're part of SUM. Our heart, again, is for you to fill your calling, to raise up kingdom leaders around the world so that the name of Jesus would be proclaimed from north to south, east to west, that multitudes of people would be healed, saved, and delivered in Jesus' name. And we hope that you will be part of this next great revival. So again, I'll be sending some emails out over these next few weeks to give you some more information on how we can help you fulfill that calling. Or maybe there's somebody you know that is sensing that call into full-time ministry to be a catalyst for revival. Thank you so much for being part of our summer class, and we just pray that you would fulfill that calling for which you were called and the purpose for which you were created in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things, one of the things since I've been involved with the SUM since 2010 is we need to raise up an army. We need, we need to raise up an army throughout the world to touch the people that's in and around them. Hey, let me remind you, if you are taking this class for credit, uh, for attendance wise, you need to make sure you type your name in the box. Some of you all may have done that before the recording started. I know Kimberly, I, your name was in there before the box. Uh, so to ensure that you're marked, make sure you get your name in the box and that you didn't put your name in there too early. Um, Second thing that I want to say is Josh Elkins is one of the students that's in our class. It's actually from Georgia. Um, and I saw that he missed class last week. And I was a little bit concerned because he wasn't in class. And then I heard from him. I saw on social media, I saw that he was on a missions trip in Colombia. And he had mentioned that that missions trip was life changing. And so I contacted him and I said, Josh, how is this, this missions trip life-changing for you? And he spoke two different things to him. He said, first of all, while I was there and while I was doing ministry and investing in other people and I was doing the work of the kingdom, God spoke two different words supernaturally through different people. One of the words that somebody spoke to me reinforced a word that was spoken over me at the eco ministry earlier in this year. Now, I have to say this here because I was talking to Josh earlier in the year. And if we were talking about the law of undulations, <laughs> Josh may have been on a plateau or he may have been down earlier in this year. But God has started working for him and God started speaking to him and calling him and spoke to him at our eco conference that we had earlier this year. And then on this mission trip in another country, in Colombia, while he's doing the work, God reinforced and the word mirrored what was happening, what was spoken over him earlier in the year. And then a second word was spoken to him through a missions, through, through a translator. And that second word that was spoken over him mirrored 
a word that was spoken over him seven years beforehand when God had called him into the ministry. Now, the reason why I wanted to say this here is because, first of all, when God's speaking to you, normally it won't just be through one witness. Sometimes it's going to be through two witnesses. And the second reason why I wanted to talk to you about how God's moving and how he's speaking is he's calling people not last year, not last month, but he's reviving people Last week, he's reviving people that are in this class. Revival can happen today. As we go into worship right now, I want you to prepare your hearts and open up your own heart and open up your own mind and say, can revival happen in me? Can it, If I've been living in a life where I'm kind of in the bottom of the undulation or if I've been living on the plateau, do I need a closer walk with Jesus right now? And do I need to have the Spirit stirred up within me? Let's worship. Come on, in this moment, I want you to just lift up your hands right now. There's no one like Jesus. There's no one like you, God. There's none besides you. You alone are worthy to be praised. Come and sing this with me. hearts, Lord. We give you our hearts. Just reach out to him tonight. Reach out to him tonight. Hey, we prepare a place. 
Here is where I lay it down Every burden, every crown This is my surrender This is my surrender Here is where I lay it down Every lie and every doubt This is my surrender And I will make room for you To do whatever you want To do whatever you want I will make room for you right now, right now. Do whatever you want. To do whatever you want. Yeah. Oh, come and do what you want to do. Right now, pour it out, pour it out, pour it out. Yeah. I will make room for you to do whatever you want. Hey, to do whatever you want.
No music, one more time. I will make room for you. Come and overtake this place, Spirit of God. And do whatever you want to. Woo. Do whatever you want to. And I will make room for you. Yeah. Do whatever you want to. To do whatever you want. Now let's wait on him. Wait on him. Wait on him. Spirit of God, breathe. Spirit of God, breathe. Hey. Solo da kiete. Se pata. Si kieta tararaba koti. Shopotite. Se te. She kieta pore da kiete. Re sotore da kiete. Si pata kiete. Re da kie shoko. O te asata yamba. She kiete raboko. Sembole ata kieta tarareba ko she kieta tarareba ko tieta tarareba ko. Ei de da kiete. I am the Lord Most High, and I am exalted in your midst. This is the generation that's going to see my glory. This is the generation that's going to see my power demonstrated when it looks hopeless. When it looks like it can't get any darker, I am coming with my light, says the Lord. I am coming into your midst, and I am overtaking every dark thing that has set itself up against the knowledge of my Son. If you will but call out to me, and cry out to me, and lift your voice, and lift your faith, and declare Jesus, declare Jesus, declare Jesus over every situation and every circumstance, you will see the glory of the Lord. Hey! We want to see your glory. 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 Oh. We hunger and thirst for you. We hunger and thirst for you. We hunger and thirst for you. Jesus. sing shake up the ground of all my tradition one more time this is prophetic tonight this nation is wrapped up in dead tradition and dead religion and we need the life of God we need the life of God to overtake every corrupt thing we need the life of God to overtake every dark thing so we're going to declare this in faith, and it takes everyone. It takes the, the people who sing, the people who don't sing. Begin to open up your mouth and declare truth. Amen? Shake up the ground of all my tradition. Break down the walls of all my religion. Your way is better. We declare it. Your way is better. Shake up the ground.
want you to start marching, church. Left, right, left, right, left, right. There's an army of worshipers rising up tonight. And we're taking back the land. Revival in Jesus' name. just want to make room right now for the Holy Spirit to do what he wants to do in this class. I just want to make room for the Holy Spirit to do what he wants to do. This last weekend, I also heard about something that's happening at one of our cohorts at Home Church in Mastic Beach, uh, New York, out on Long Island. Long Island is pretty well affluent except for one little beach and that's Mastic Beach and there's a lot of poverty and drugs and and various different things that's in that area. Well, Home Church is located there and they've been doing ministry there for a long time. One of the things that that happened during COVID is the building that they were in, they were prevented from meeting in that building, the building that they were renting. And so what they did is they bought a tent so that they could still have services during COVID. This is in New York on Long Island. Uh, and they have used that tent for their services for the last three years. Even during the winter time, they're having services and seeking the presence of God. Um, four or five of the people, some SUM alumni and some other people that, that was from that church went to Brazil, and as they put it uh, in the month of June, June they stepped into a, a spirit of revivalism that was in Brazil, and they were a part of that, and they decided, we're just going to bring this back home. And if we were going door-to-door -door in Brazil, let's go door-to-door -door on Long Island. And so what they did is Monday through thir Thursday, they're going door to door. And every Friday night in the month of July, they've been having open air meetings in their tent. They just pop open the sides and they're having services and they're seeing people get saved. They're having people walk in off the street and say, we want to get water baptized. Uh, when I asked her, I said, are people being baptized in the Holy Spirit? She says, there's so many people been being baptized in the Holy Spirit. We can't count them all. Uh, just, it seems like there's just a revival that's happening. Uh, as they're going door to door, they're praying over people. They're seeing healings. They're seeing uh, deliverances. They're seeing various different things happen as they're, they're trying to do the gospel and God is moving in their church and in that area. Why do I say that? I say that so that you guys understand that revival is happening today. I asked Crystal Miller, I said to her, if you can, if you could say one thing to people about the revival that's sort of happening in your church, she, what would you say? And she said, make the Holy Spirit first and welcome him to come in and to move. Make the Holy Spirit first. One of the students one of the SUM alumni, and she's also a student in the master's program now, 
I saw her make a Facebook post last night. She made the following statement. She said, when a fire is burning, we need to keep feeding the fire so that it will continue to burn. Feeding the fire to burn. I guess one thing that I want to say to you guys about this class is that we want to see a fire burn in you. We want to see a fire burn in you. And I'm really excited about the speaker that we're going to have today as she travels all over Asia and India and, uh, and Africa doing revivals, mass revivals, and calling people to the Lord. Uh, she is what Reinhard Bonnke would call a power evangelist because when she comes in, is she doing evangelism and is she holding open air crusades? Yes, she is. But she's praying that the Holy Spirit will be first and that the Holy Spirit will heal people and will change their lives. As I introduce Dr. Uh, Edith Prakash, Prak, Prakash, as I introduce Dr. Edith, I want to show you a promo that she has for her ministry. And then as soon as that promo ends, Dr. Edith is going oh, to start yeah. sharing with us. This one wrong move, you are going to heaven to be with Jesus. <laughs> this is truly the track that says, the cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back. So when you come to Nepal with me for ministry, make sure your sins are all forgiven and you're ready to see Jesus. <laughs> Okay, guys, I want to tell a testimony. This sweet lady is a pastor's wife of this area on the mountain. And last night she saw a dream. In that dream she saw me wearing this yellow dress, coming to this church and talking about the Holy Spirit. And she said, this, this, ch this chain is pure silver. And she said, I want to give this to you. And she wanted to give me a hug. It's so beautiful to see, you know, people give everything they have to make it special for visitors and for God's people. So may God bless you today. Thank you. Thank you so much. I love you. We are finally on the top of this mountain. Our car radiator got heated up and the water started boiling. So the last 15 minutes we had to trek up. I didn't even have the right shoes. But I was told today, people came three hours walking to this little church to hear the word of God. and the church is nestled in the middle of the steel leaf plantations.
you're coming with me next year. This is so beautiful. No one ever said it. For all the people who prayed for this meeting, thank you. Because of your prayers, they were all able to hear the word of God today. God bless. At this time, I'd like to present to you Dr. Edith Prakash. Dear friends, greetings to you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It gives me great joy and a privilege for me to talk to you today, teach this class all the way from India. We live in Virginia Beach and we have a ministry there called Prakash Ministries. So we live as a family there. But during summer, whenever the school is done, we are on our summer trekking to six nations of the world having mass evangelistic crusades. We just finished our crusades in South Sudan, Uganda, Kenya, India, and on our way to Lebanon and back to America. So I'm so excited to you know, talk to you about what the Lord is doing in Asia, specific, specifically India, Nepal, the neighboring countries. Many times, you know, God would take you to thousands one time. Sometimes he may just take you to one person. Either way, it's all about hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit, honoring the Lord and saying, yes, Lord, I'm willing to go where you call me. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Paul and Dr. Aaron Yom and Dr. Enoch for this wonderful privilege, for inviting me to share this class of global evangelism, revivals in Asia with you. Evangelism is my passion. Both my parents are converted from Hinduism and both of them are mass evangelists. Since a baby, every weekend of my life, I've been in the crusade, preaching and singing along with my parents. And so when I went back home to America, um, you know, I went to Christ with the Nation, did my undergrad there, then went to Regent, finished my master's program, and then um, and did my PhD, my dissertation on T.L. Osborne. And while during my dissertation, I said, Lord, I want to do a topic that I will use in the future because I'm crazily in love with Jesus and I'm crazy about speaking about Jesus to people around the world. As you all know, India is a country of many, many idols. Uh, people in India say there are 33 million gods and India people worship the creation more than the creator. Because of the karma, they believe, you know, if you're a good person, you'll be born a good person. If not, you know, life goes on, the circle of life. So because of that, everything created could be a, having a form of God. But we worship the creator God. What an honor and a privilege for me tonight to talk about this Jesus and what is happening in India, in Asia, in many, many countries. The Bible says this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to the ends of the earth, then the end will come. I love this quote about from William Booth. William Booth said, I am not waiting on the move of God. I am the move of God. Come on, everybody say that with me, wherever you are, all across the globe. Say, I am not waiting on the move of God. I am the move of God. I love that quote by William Booth. You know, my friend, before God can do something through you, he does something in you. We are living in the most exciting times of our life. Every prayer that Jesus prayed, the disciples prayed, the saints have prayed through the ages. You and I are now living in order to bring in the harvest, a global harvest. Just imagine this. If the devil did not know something amazing was coming, why did he bring COVID? He knew something amazing was coming. And so that's why COVID has come. But let me tell you something. When your focus is on the Lord, God says, seek first the kingdom. Everything shall be added to you. Seek first the kingdom, everything. And I agree totally with Dr. Paul was saying, you know, the other evangelist, she said, you know, honor the Holy Spirit, invite him. And that's what we're going to do right now. Before I start this class, I just want to invite the Holy Spirit for a moment to pray and to ask his presence to fill this room. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we invite you to this class, Lord. Here are your vessels, amazing vessels all across the globe. They are hungry. They are thirsty. They are waiting for a great move of God. Lord, I pray tonight as I share your word, as I teach this class, they will catch the anointing, Lord, that they will catch your perspective for their life. 
I pray for a mighty anointing in this program right now that every single one of them will feel the heavy, weighty glory. I pray for an open heaven and manifest presence. I pray the anointing to break every yoke. And I pray even today, God, that faith will arise, faith will arise. And Lord, that they will begin to see signs and wonders and miracles. Lord, I thank you for even right now that your glory is coming. Every room that people are watching, we give you glory and honor. Father, take this over this class even now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, what is revival? Revival begins with each individual. Where there is humility, where there is repentance, true repentance, that is an environment conducive for revival. Acts chapter 10, 38, the Bible says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. He went around doing good, healed them all. God anointed Jesus beyond measure. Why is Isaiah 61 says, you know, spirit of the Lord is on me. Why? What is the reason for the anointing? To break the bondages, to, to speak the acceptable year of the Lord, to proclaim God's goodness, God's favor, for the blind to see, the lame to walk. Because when the anointing is on you, my friend, you are not an ordinary person. You are a supernatural person. Revival begins with you and revival begins with me. Much of Bob Pierce's work was in Asia. It was a year after visiting the suffering children on the island of Korea that he wrote his famous prayer in the Bible. He said, Lord, let my heart be broken for the things that break the heart of God. When we begin to pray prayers like that, Lord, use me. You know, we read in the Bible, when Samuel anointed David, Bible says the spirit of the Lord rushed to come on David. The anointing of God, the, the Holy Spirit loved to anoint David for that purpose. But in Psalm 51, we read, when David said, David says, Lord, don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. My dear friend, salvation is free but anointing is costly. And if you want to do world evangelism, global evangelism, especially in countries like India and Africa, we better be prayed up. You better be overflowing in the anointing because these are countries that are dark. There are tons and thousands and millions of demons. And they will say, Paul, I know Jesus. I know who are you? But when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, they will tell you, what should I do? People will run. People who worship other religions will run to you and say, what will I, should I do to be saved? God wants to do amazing things. You know, John Wesley said this. John Wesley said, um, light yourself with fire and passion and people will come to watch you burn. Light yourself with passion and with fire and people will come to watch you burn. I believe when this happens, as Wesley would say, the world becomes your parish. God says, but before God pours out the anointing, sanctification always precedes manifestation because God cannot take this powerful anointing and put on somebody that's not ready. That's why be between the promise and the fulfillment, there is a great process. The more you yield to the process, the more you yield to the brokenness of God, the more you repent, the more we say, Lord, less of me and more of you. You know, the Bible says John the Baptist was the greatest born of the woman. You know why that is? First, he humbled himself. Secondly, he had a revelation. When he baptized Jesus, his, his, his people, his congregation told him, the guy that you baptized emptied your church and he's baptizing the other people across from Jordan. And John the Baptist gives this powerful revelation. He says, nobody can get anything that is not given to them from above. Yes, my dear friend, your calling comes from God. Your anointing comes from God. Your gifting comes from God. That's why it's very important. And this, when you're in the Bible college and asking the Lord what to do, that your, your calling and your gifting and your passion, all this comes in alignment. God's will, God's desire, your obedience, and God's timing. God's will, your obedience, and God's timing. When all this lines up together, you will have a open heaven. Sanctification is key to for power evangelism. Paul said, I'm not coming to you with persuasive words, but with what? Power and demonstration 
of the Holy Spirit. You know, going to these countries like Africa and India and Asia, I see there's a lot of thirst for more of God. You know, we were in Burma recently, about a few years ago, and a couple of years ago, and we had a meeting there in a closed YMCA auditorium. And that, that because not many people can go to Burma, there's not many, much of evangelism done there. When we were speaking, there was this lady that came to me for prayer. Her whole body had white patches, like, you know, like an albino patch, but full body. And she was demon possessed. I mean, seven people are trying to hold her down, but she was so strong, you know, beating up on them. And for like half an hour, we all tried and prayed. And finally, the demon left her. The next day I came and I was praying in that, I mean, praying for people in the altar call. And I see this beautiful lady and she comes and stands next to me and she says, sister, do you remember me? I said, no. She said, I am the woman that you prayed yesterday. You know what happened? When that demon left her, it took the disease along with it. She had a skin of a baby with no, no discoloration, completely normal. My dear friend, we are living in exciting times. You know, when you look at the history of the church, the disciples laid the foundation of the church. The third century Roman, um, I mean, third century theologian, Tertullian said, the seed of the church is the blood of the martyrs. As Roman Catholic Church began to be institutionalized, the focus shifted from the finished work of Christ to work-oriented salvation until Luther came along and wanted to bring renewal within the church. He never wanted to start an own organization and he wrestled with the evils of the society. He wrestled with indulgence. He wrestled with how people worked hard and paid money for their salvation. He said, this cannot be. And I want to speak to those children of God right now, the wonderful, amazing soldiers of the future. If you are wrestling with the culture, wrestling and there's, uh, there's a struggle that's going on and you're, and you're looking for answers, you are in the right place. Luther struggled. Scholars call that the dark night of the soul until one day he had the revelation. What was the revelation? The just shall live by faith. And as the Lutheran church began to be complacent, you know, we have God raised up John Wesley. He had a revelation. Without holiness, no man can see God. And we can even say that even today, with all the atrocities that are happening in every country, you know, as we travel to all these countries, I can tell you there is no America sin or no India sin or no Africa sin. Sin is sin. Bible says human heart is desperately wicked. Sin is sin, but a group of people, God is grooming. God is waking them up in the night. God is giving them burden. They are not satisfied who, who they are. They are going to God and saying, Lord, if I, if I perish, I perish. I've come into the kingdom for such a time as this. And that was Wesley at his time. He's like, without holiness, no man can see God. And after, you know, the Methodists, all this started becoming complacent. At the turn of the century, we come to know about the Pentecostal movement. You know, in 1906, we have the Azusa Street Revival. And from the Azusa, people were sent all over the world to spread the Pentecostal phenomenon. While we're talking about this, I want to talk to you about the history of Pentecostalism in India. The origins of Christianity in India was a result of Apostle Thomas. Apostle Thomas, when, the, when Jesus died, the disciples cast lots and India fell under Apostle Thomas. And Apostle Thomas says, Lord, send me anywhere except India. Those heathen people, I don't know them. His ministry is hard. Is anybody saying that today? God send me anywhere except Africa. God send me anywhere but India. Guess what? Where you don't want to go is where God's going to send you. Why? It's in your weakness. His strength is going to be manifested. And so in a, a St. Thomas, I don't have time to go into the history of India, but you can um, you know, read my book uh, on T.L. Osborne. The, the first chapter is on origins of Christianity in India. So when St. Thomas came to India, you know, he saw pagan people and he saw poor people. And he was, and this king in, in India, Gondaforis, wanted to build a palace. So he came here as a carpenter and he took all the money and gave it to the poor people. And when the king asked him, where's the money? He said, I built a palace for you in heaven. 
And according to tradition, you know, the king's brother died and he goes to heaven and sees the palace, comes back and tells the king. And next thing, you know, the king gives him favor to go all across South India to preach the gospel. So as tradition goes, that's how he started the ministry. But and at the death of St. Thomas, which is in Chennai, I'm in Chennai right now, 20 minutes from here is where St. Thomas is buried. It's called St. Thomas Church. While he was praying, a Hindu guy, uh, a Brahmin, cast a spear and he died. After his death, uh, the Christians that he converted were called St. Thomas Christians. And it's so amazing how beautifully Christianity was contextualized in India. The St. Thomas Christians, usually high caste Christian, the beautiful thing about conversion is the moment you convert from Hinduism, you lose all your your caste privileges. You no longer a high caste or low caste, a middle caste. You become just a Christian, a forward caste. So in the Hindu people at that time, if they would touch a person that is of low caste, and if they want to become clean, they would touch a St. Thomas Christian. So people love St. Thomas Christian. So India was amazing and wonderful until the, um, the Portuguese came in the 15th century. When the Portuguese came, there was a lot of confusion because the Portuguese were loyal to uh, Rome, to the Pope, while India was connected, the liturgy was in Syriac. And so the, the, the Portuguese wanted to make India come under the Roman rule, but it did not happen. So in the 15th century, in 1599, in the Synod of Diaper, there was a huge split where part of St. Thomas Christians stayed in the Syrian liturgy, and part of them divided and joined with the Portuguese. And at this Synod of Diamper, what the Portuguese did was they burned all the documents, every paper, everything, books that they had, the liturgy, they, because they believe that the Syriac literature, the, Christ, the church in India was going under Nestorianism, under false teaching. So they burned all the documents. So there was a huge split. And later on, Several ministry, missionaries came around from Dan, Danish missionaries and other missionaries came along, American missionaries. And, you know, later on, we had the Pentecostal movement. But something that was very interesting in India is in 1904, a group of Welsh Presbyterian ministry in the Kasi Hills of North India began to pray for revival after they heard about the Welsh revival. And pheno similar phenomena like the Welsh revival happened in the Kasi Hills of India. And also in the orphanage of a woman called Pandita Ramaboy. She was a very famous woman. She had an orphanage. She was a um, social activist and fighting for the freedom of women in India. And in her orphanage, there was Pentecostal um, phenomenon even before, prior to Azusa Street Revival in 1906. But even before that, in 1870, there was a revival recorded among the South Indian people in Chennai of Shanars, where there's occurrence of, you know, seeking in tongues and Pentecostal-like phenomenon. So India has a rich history of revival even prior to Azusta. But when you look into the history of Pentecostalism in India, Frank Bottleman, one of America's Pentecostalism most important pioneers, acknowledged that the present worldwide revival was rocked in the cradle of little whales. It was brought up in India and became full-blown in Los Angeles. Again, from the Azusa Street Revival, the baptism of the Holy Spirit spread globally and missionaries from there were sent to different parts of the world to spread the revival. One such person that came to India was A.G. Gar and his wife, Lillian Gar. When they were in Azusa, when they were baptized with the Holy Spirit, a man that attended the Azusa City Revival said A.G. Gar spoke in the Bengali language. So A.G. Gar assumed, which means he needed to come to India that, and spread this phenomenon. When he came to India, to Calcutta, he realized the tongues that, that he had was not Bengali. And he was very disappointed, but they got themselves together and started doing ministry work. And through the ministry of A.G. Gar, you can go and read it later on in, on the web, and his wife Lil Lillian Gar were a great instrument in spreading Pentecostalism in Northern India. And, uh, you know, and then we know that in the 1960s, the charismatic revival in India, you know, it disseminated, you know, many ideas among the mainline churches and mainline churches also begin to raise their hand and sing like the Pentecostal 
except tongues, they had everything else. But in India, what's beautiful is around 1960s, they started having crusade evangelism. Crusade is very common in India. While the Anglicans and the Lutherans are very traditional in their churches, like they don't even like people clapping their hands or using musical instruments or drums. They're very traditional. But when it, when it comes to a crusade, all the Christians will come together, like Lutheran, Presbyterian, um, you know, Pentecostal. And they all come together. They love lively music. They love the healing. They love the world. And many evangelists from many different denominations, you know, particularly like DDS Dinakaran, um, my father, Nataraja Modaliar, my mom, many other evangelists started having this crusade that united the body of Christ together, where Pentecostal phenomenon was became a common as they came and sang and they spoke in tongues and they would come to fasting prayers. In fact, the Pentecostalism has grown and Pentecostal-like phenomena has grown to such a great extent today in India, there are huge prayer movements. This Saturday, I'm going to be speaking in a prayer movement in a tip of India called Nalumavadi, um, the a prayer movement led by Mohanzi Lazarus. Uh, called, it's from the ministry called Jesus Redeems. And we, I'm going to be probably speaking to about 20 to 30,000 people. The hall can hold 45,000. I don't know how many, but thousands and thousands of people are going to come there. And they are coming for healing, for deliverance, for revival. Many Hindu converts, secret Christians, they're all going to be coming and, and I'm going to be preaching. And so amazing thing about these crusades, it brings people together. If you can get that slide of my father back on, you just skip that slide. I want to share something in that. Um, I just saw a picture of my dad in 1970. My father came from South Africa to India as a missionary. My father and my mother were both born in Hindu families. And when he converted to Christian in an amazing encounter with God, my grandmother was very sick, admitted in the hospital. The Hindu soothsayers told my dad he needed to walk on coals of fire for my grandmother to get better. So my dad walked on hot coals for this, uh, my grandmother's healing, but my grandmother died. And my father became an atheist. And, and one day, as he was very disgusted with life, a friend invited him to church. And for the first time, he went to a Christian church and he heard the gospel. And for the first time, he realized he didn't have to do anything, but God paid the price, the penalty for his sin. All he had to do was receive Jesus. He not only received Jesus, that night he got, the preacher gave him a call to India and said, the Lord is calling you back to India, back to your people. My dad's from Durban, South Africa, back to India to give them the good news of the gospel that you have experienced. So my father came in 1969 to India as an evangelist, singing evangelist. And my mom uh, my dad would play um, um, accordion. My mom would play guitar. My dad would preach in English. My mom would translate. For 12 years, they had crusades like you see on the screen. That's one of my dad's crusades in 1970. They were Pentecostal evangelists all throughout the country. They brought many, many, many thousands of people in the saving knowledge of Jesus. They had Bible school. They had orphanages. But in 1984, my dad was very sick, admitted in the hospital. And he told my mother, my time is done. I'm going to go be with Jesus. I want you to make my two children missionaries. And on my birthday, my father died. But before he died, he prayed for me and said, Lord, the anointing that is on me, let it be on my children and my children's children. My dear friend, why am I saying that to you today? Because I am living the dream that God has for me. Every nation, every country, in, in, the, in April, we went to Albania. Albania opened up. Macedonia opened up. Greece is opening up. The beautiful thing about COVID is that it has toiled the soil of the world for global evangelism. Three years ago, when we had a crusade in Greece, you know, five people come to church. <laughs> but now people are so hungry. They want to know about the Lord all over the world. Spirit of the Lord is moving. There is a groaning that is taking place. Creation is groaning for the second coming of Jesus. And God needs you. And after my death of my father, my mother took over the ministry. And, and I was raised in crusades all my life. And when I graduated from America, 
um, the Lord asked, I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And when I graduated my PhD, the Lord said, Edith, what do you want to do? I said, Lord, I want to take the gospel of Jesus to the ends of the earth. The Lord said, take up your Bible and go. My dear friend, God has been so faithful. People out there whose, whose dream is global evangelism, I'm going to tell you, don't worry about how much money you have. Don't worry about the talents you have. Don't worry about if you are qualified. You are what the world needs. I know as being Bible college students, we compare with, you know, oh God, you did this for T.L. Osborne. You did that for Reinhard Bonke. But let me tell you, Reinhard Bonke, T.L. Osborne, Bernie Graham, everybody's taken. The world needs you. If your heart is still beating, and if you're still alive after the pandemic, it's because there's something that only you can give the world. Now is your time. The anointing, my friend, it cannot be caught. It, it cannot be taught. It has to be caught. Let that stirring take place. And like Esther, you say, Lord, if I perish, I perish. But I've come into the kingdom for such a time as this. When you go, when you seek God, everything that you need, God will provide for you. These four weeks that we were in Africa, big, big, big crusade. God supplied every need, every need. We had medical camps. We were prepared for 500 people. God gave us 1,200. God multiplied. Even today, the same Jesus is alive. Today, my, my job for this class is to motivate you to dream higher, to think higher, to believe higher. Because if God is all you have tonight, you have all that you need. Let me tell you how Pentecostalism grown in India today. When it started in 1906, Pentecostals were shunned by the local community. The Hindu people wanted to do nothing with them. Why? Because at that time, in the early uh, founding times of Christ Christianity in India, Pentecostal did not wear jewelry because they wanted to make a statement to the world that we are in the world, but not of the world. They were very simple. So when an Anglican person or mainline person or Hindu person saw Pentecostals, they were like, oh, these people are the hallelujah crowd. You know, they don't wear jewelry. They wear only white clothes. They are super spiritual men. I can't, we, we can't be like them. They were shunned. But today... Every almost all the Pentecostal churches in India are thriving. In fact, a new denom, a new organization has come up in South India called the Synod of Pentecostal Churches. Pentecostalism is growing in India. In places like Karnataka, where there was persecution, a group of people started breaking churches. So when the churches began to complain to the government, when the government asked them, what denomination you belong to, who is your covering, they had no covering. And because of that, they didn't have a strong voice in the government to protect them. So because of this need, a group of 15 people got together and formed the Synod of Pentecostal Churches. Based on their request for spiritual covering, the Synod of Pentecostal Churches were created to unite all the independent churches under one umbrella to give them empowerment, as established churches before the government of India. Today, the Synod has more than 20,000 churches, which is less. They have more than that. I'm just being moderate. More than 20,000 churches, a board that is recognized by the government and a movement that is recognized as the fourth largest cream of Christianity in India. The once shunned invisible Pentecostalism is now visible. There is a huge contribution People all over India, South India, especially where I come from, Chennai, there is no difference between the Charismatics and the Pentecostals. Pentecostals have um, um, compromised a bit. You know, Pentecostal people now do wear jewelry, many of them. And, you know, they are becoming more like everybody else, have nice houses, wear nice cars. And they are not as legalistic as the founders of this movement, however. So Pentecostalism has been incorporated into the local community. And um, it is growing in India. All the Pentecostal churches are thriving. The Assembly of God Church in Chennai is, going, is just building a 25,000 seater. Um, many, many Pentecostal churches are huge in India and they are growing. So thank God. <laughs> Evangelism today is the heartbeat of God. The, the Pentecostal Synod, they recently had a meeting where more than 50,000 people attended, many, many Pentecostal pastors. I knew this firsthand information because I talked to the deputy president, KB Edison, 
about this movement. He is the one that is deputy president who is going to be president in September. I am so excited for what the Lord is doing. In fact, that the government recognized the Pentecostal movement as the fourth largest stream was just a huge accomplishment by this organization. And also, when you have an organization backing you like this, that has a visible presence in the community, evangelism also becomes, um, uh, you know, it gives you, it gives people the protection that you need. At least even if they can't protect you all the time, then there is persecution and the persecuting Christians are burning, which is happening right now all over India, especially in a city called Manipur. Churches are all being burnt, which is happening. But the organizations like the Synod of Pentecostal Churches helps them to give a voice and gives a covering. Well, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. So how do we do it? Very simple. Just obey the great commission and just do it. Just go. Now, I remember when I was studying in Regent and doing my PhD, it took a long time. I did my dissertation on T.L. Osborne. Here is my book, um, The Extraordinary Ministry of um, T.L. Osborne, and the book is called Yesterday, Today, and Forever. It's out of print right now, but we will republish it shortly, and you can get it. But while I was doing this uh, dissertation, I had to study 25,000 pages of primary work, but I'm so glad I did that. You know why? His life story impacted me to pursue greater things for God. You know, Psalm 23, verse 5, the Bible says, Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of my life. If you want to see a global harvest, all you got to do is to keep the Holy Spirit overflowing. First thing is you need to have intimacy with Jesus. You know, the disciples, they never, they were not educated. They were not, you know, great people. They were fishermen. And when Jesus was, you know, taken up in ascension, they all stood there thinking, Lord, you are going away. Who is going to help us? Jesus said to them, it is good that I go because when I go, I will send you a comforter. When that comforter comes, he will lead you into all truth. And so that Holy Spirit radically changed the lives of the disciples after they got together in unity and in one accord. My dear friend, even today, what is hindering the Pentecostal movement? Because, you know, Mahatma Gandhi said, if every Christian would live like a Christian, there will be no Hindus in India, which is so true because everybody knows about Jesus. They know about the word. They're actually looking for Christians who actually would live and do what the Bible says. And so intimacy with Jesus is very, very important in criteria, in criteria to see do global evangelism. Lord, I want to know you. They that know their God will do great exploits. You just have to release the anointing of the Holy Spirit in your life. And our prayer should be, Lord, let your voice be louder than any other voice in my life. Productivity comes when you're completely yielded to the will of God. A verse that changed my life was not everybody who says, Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom, but only those who do the will of the Father. My dear friend, it doesn't matter where you go, what you do. What matters is, are you doing the will of God? Jonah did not go to Nineveh, to Tarshish, to sin. He went there to do ministry. That's why in the Bible it says, many people will come to you and say, Lord, I, I cast out demons in your name. I healed in your name. And Jesus will say, I don't know you. There is a slogan that I have in my life that I always say to myself that I invented. It says, I say, God's will done God's way will bring exponential increase. God's will done my way will bring disaster. It's all about less of me, Lord, and more of you, more of you. God, let me go down. Let my flesh become nothing. So it is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You know, when God called Moses, Moses says, God, what is your name? I don't even know your name. And God says, I am that I am Moses. When you have that intimacy with Jesus, and when God says, I am who that, who I am that I am, he's saying, when I call you, I, you need me in so many different facets of your life. You need me as a provider. You need me as a Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Shalom, God of peace. You need me to fight your battle. You need me to provide for you. Whatever that may be, 
when I call you, I'm going to be everything that you need me to be. You know, <clears throat> when I graduated and I went to college, God never told me who was going to be my donor. He just said, go take the gospel. Friends, today we had a meeting in South Sudan three weeks ago. South Sudan, can you believe? When I was in Christ for the Nation, preaching in Voice of Healing Cindy, with Cindy Jacobs, Cindy pulled me aside and said, Edith, these are the country God is going to take you. And she's, you know, she said a lot of countries. One of the country was South Sudan. At that moment, I thought, no way. I don't even know anybody in South Sudan. But while I was in Uganda preaching in the church, that pastor said, we are having a crusade in South Sudan. Immediately, the Holy Spirit just leaped and said, that's, that's it. That's it right there. And they invited me to South Sudan. You won't believe how we preach. When we travel in the road, the, the whole the Sudan United Christians for Christ had to give us an invitation letter. When I got off the plane, the whole bishops and all these big people had to come in and take us from the plane, escort us into a van, and the immigration comes to you, and then you go to the hotel. You cannot go anywhere in the country, the hotel and the stage. When we traveled in Sudan, in front of us, we had a convoy of 25 soldiers, uh, uh, you know, guards, completely loaded with AK-47. Behind me, we had security guards. Only like that way we can go in the street, straight to the pulpit. When they gave the altar call and started praying for people, I had like 10 bodyguards just running and said, no, you can't touch the people. I said, you know what? Until God protects me, nobody can. Zechariah 2, 5 says, I will be a wall of fire around you. I will be the glory in your midst. When we started praying and felt the fire of God in my hand, I said, no, I want to touch every single one. And I touched them and I prayed. So many demons left. And while I was praying, the Lord said, Edith, would you go to the prison of South Sudan? The next day, the health minister came and met me in the hotel. I, she just came to pray with me. I said, can you take me to the prison of South Sudan? Here we were. We can't even get out of the hotel. And I said, no, I want to put my feet. You know why? When you put your feet there, God says, ask of me. I'll give you nations. Wherever you put your feet, God said, I will give that to you. We went to the prison. Gave them 200 Arabic Bible. When I gave the salvation, 100 prisoners received Jesus. My dear friend, why am I sharing all this? The harvest is plenty, but laborers are few. There's a world out there waiting for you. Say yes to God. Go in the strength that you have. I am that I am. We'll go before you and we will make the crooked path straight. He will increase what you have. We have an orphanage in Uganda with 150 children. As I was giving them a donut, the local children came and joined the line. And I said, Lord, I don't want to send any kid empty-handed today. I never looked at that container. I kept giving these donuts to these children. And guess what? The donuts never ran off. Every child till the last child got a donut. My dear friend, if you have radical faith, if you have radical love, even today, I do not worry about anything. All I worry about is protecting the anointing, protecting the power of the Holy Ghost. You know, we've, and in this crusade in Uganda, as I was preaching, the Lord said, today, I'm going to heal somebody. Actually, that was the clip that I thought they would pray, play it for you today. Completely packed ground. And this man who was born deaf, the Lord gave me a word of knowledge. Somebody with deaf person is going to be healed. When I called this grandpa, you know, came running to the stage. And we prayed for him. Like I said, Paul was absolutely right. When you lift up the name of Jesus, when you invite the Holy Spirit, and when you lift up the cross, amazing miracles begin to happen. Because why? You, your job and my job is only to create an atmosphere where the Holy Spirit can move. Where there is faith, there is victory. Where there is humility, God's presence increases. And while I humbled myself and I prayed for this man who was born deaf, in just a minute, in the name of Jesus, he was totally, you could hear, and he kept screaming, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Non-Christians came to God. That's the story of T.L. Osborne. In, you need to have an encounter with Jesus. T.L. Osborne was born in America, and God called him as an evangelist, and he was doing you know, a lot of ministry in America. And when he was 18 years old, he felt a call to India. He and his wife left everything and they came to India as missionaries. When he came, I'm going to make it short because of time. 
when he came to Punjab and he started the ministry, his missionary boards that he should first learn the language and then minister. He came to his house and he started having Bible study. He invited a Hindu, he invited a Muslim, and he invited a Christian, and he began to share the Bible. When he said the Bible says, the Hindu said, the Bhagavad Gita says. When he says the Bible says, the Muslim said, the Quran says. And T.L. Osborne was shocked. He said, these people don't even believe in the Bible. How am I going to reveal, talk about Jesus to them? And things got very hard. He caught uh, you know, typhoid, almost dying. He went back to America as a failure. But when he went to America, his, his passion for India never failed. He, he could, when he closed his eyes, he could see millions of people that were running behind other religions. He saw lepers, he saw poor people, and he began to cry and says, Lord, what is the answer for India? At that time, an evangelist called Charles Price was going, had to come to his hometown. So he was going to attend that crusade, but that uh, shortly one week ago, before the, the crusade could start, Charles Price died. And T.L. began to cry again, Lord, now who is going to fill the stadium? Who is going to preach the gospel? Who is going to do miracles? And as he was crying on that ground, the Lord said to T.L., T.L., you are the man that's going to do miracles. He couldn't even believe that. After that, a movement called Haiti Hammond came and to that crusade that Charles Price had to come. And Haiti Hammond preached a message like this. She said, if you see Jesus, you will never be the same again. T.L. Osborne was fired up. He came home and he cried and he cried and he cried. This is Lord, I'm not leaving this room until I, 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 I come to know you. Next day, six o'clock, Jesus walked into his bedroom for three hours. Tears was flowing from his eyes. He couldn't move a finger or a toe. In fact, while he was telling me these experiences, I was writing down and my husband was videotaping in his office and we couldn't even hold the camera. The glory of the Lord filled that room and he saw Jesus and God's love filled his heart. And long story short, they had a meeting in Jamaica. Many, many people got healed. When they came back to America and when he was in Flint, Michigan, he got a call from F.F. F. Bosworth to come to finish the crusade of William Brenham because Brenham was very, very tired. So that day as Osborne was going to go to that meeting. The Lord woke him up with this word that said, today I'm going to exalt you like Joshua in the sight of your people. When he got to the auditorium, the auditorium was so huge and a lot of people were there. And he said, Lord, I cannot pray individually to all these people. They are huge. And that's when the Lord gave him this question that said, um, how big is possible? How big is possible? And God said to T.L., if you pray for one people, one person, would they be healed? He said, yes. Then he said, if you pray for, if you pray, can everybody be healed? He said, yes. And that's when he began. T.L. Osborne is the initiator of the mass healing movement. And of all the evangelists of our time, <laughs> T.L. Osborne was the initiator of the mass healing movement. In that meeting, when he prayed, hundreds of people got healed. My dear friend, his life was never the same again. God used him mightily. In fact, the roots of uh, Pentecostalism in Uganda, in Kenya, in East Africa goes back to T.L. Osborne. I just ministered in that pastor who translated was T.L. Osborne, who, who was mentored by T.L. Osborne in Uganda. It was amazing. 10,000 people are coming to that church today. And the glory of God is all over that place. Um, Robert Kayanja, his, his ministry, his miracle center in Uganda incredible mentor by T.L. Osborne. Anyway, long story short, T.L. came back to India in 1960. When he came back to India and had a crusade in Madurai, thousands, 80,000 people came. And when he gave an altar call, 80,000 hands went up in air. When the hands went up in the air, it felt like a brown harvest, harvest of wheat. He turned around to the Indian people and said, the harvest is plenty. And in that meeting sat a evangelist, Indian evangelist called DGS Dinakaran. And he said, Lord, would you use only Americans? Would you use me also, Lord? And that healing mantle fell on him. And because T.L. Osborne converted many, many souls for the next 20 years, he couldn't come to India. And God started using DGS Dinakaran, who sat in that crusade in a mighty way. 
as a healing evangelist all over India to bring millions of people to the kingdom of God. Thirdly, my friend, divine encounter, intimacy with God, and thirdly, divine connections. 500 people want to follow Jesus. Out of the 500, Jesus prayed and he chose only two, 12. And out of the 12, Jesus was close to only three people. You need divine connections. God gave the vision to Moses, but Moses could not put a nail on the wall. And God said to Moses, I've already uh, anointed Bezalel and Athenian in Exodus chapter 31 to do everything I've commanded you to do. My dear friend, find your divine connections. Fire ignites fire. Iron sharpens iron. Find your divine connection. People who will impact you, who will take you to the next level. In fact, you can never avoid the Judas and the Thomas. If you want to go to the next level, it is your enemies who will take you to the next level. Jesus never avoided Judas and Thomas. If you keep them with you, if they may betray you, but you will go to the next level. Jesus entered his greatest level when he was betrayed by Thomas. But look what happened because of the cross. The Bible says after Jesus died, the same Holy Spirit that resurrected Jesus from the grave dwells within you and me. It's not, a, you know, in one Psalm 139, the David says, Lord, where can I run from your presence? That's the omnipotent presence. In, and then that God talk about the indwelling presence. In Ezekiel 26, 36, the Bible says, God says, you know, I will dwell among you and, and, and I will be your God. But then in Genesis chapter 3, we read about the manifest presence. When God said, let us create man in our image. Every day evening, God would come and talk to Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. Because of sin, separation came between God and man. But because of Jesus, the second Adam, you and I, I can regain that fellowship with God once again. Not just pockets of revival, not just, not just ha habitation, not just visitation, but habitation dwelling in his presence in the old testament the holy spirit came upon the ark but in the new testament he indwells you that's the fellowship jesus walked with adam and eve god wants to walk with you he wants to talk with you he wants you to touch heaven and change earth in fact the bible says in psalm chapter 32 verse 8 i will show you the way you must go i will keep my eyes on you and counsel you my dear friend the world is waiting for you. They're the big harvest. This weekend alone, I have two meetings where we are reaching 70,000 people. Do you want to be a part of that? It's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Here, spend, Jesus said, every morning Jesus woke up while it was still dark and he spent time and he prayed. Prayer life is very important. When you pray, you have the mind of Christ. The Bible says the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him and he reveals his covenant to them. Spend time in prayer. Spend time in the word. Psalm chapter one. When you meditate the word of God, you'll be like a tree that is planted by rivers of living water that brings forth its fruit, even when it is not a season. When you are saturated with the anointing, when you go just stand in the stage and when you ask the Holy Spirit to come, the manifest presence will come. The glory will come. Even before you say a word, people will run to the altar. They will get saved. My dear friend, this is your time. You are the one and God needs you. This gospel of the kingdom shall preach to the ends of the earth. Then the end will come. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, I pray for every single one of my brother and sister watching this video. Lord, I've seen your glory throughout this year, throughout this summer. Oh, Lord, I've seen thousands and thousands coming into the kingdom, Lord. The gospel has power to stand on its own. Lord, we are just an instrument, a vessel that you use, oh, Lord. Oh, but when we yield to your wonderful promise, when we yield to your will, when we yield to the fire, when we yield to, to the process that you're calling us to go and go do things, Lord, how amazingly we cannot even imagine or think the wonderful things that you have for your children in store, Lord. 
Right now, I pray for every single person that is crying out to you. God, I pray that their heart will be warmed. I pray for a fire anointing. I pray for the manifest presence of the Holy Ghost to come. Lord, I pray even tonight, faith will arise. We come against every depression, every discouragement, Lord, every insecurity. In the name of Jesus, Father, we break away every lies of the enemy that makes our children focus on the limitations of their life. Father, tonight I pray that every obstacle, every mountain that is standing against God's will in their life will completely be broken in the name of Jesus. God, you said you came that you may destroy the work of the enemy. Lord, every setback, Lord, every hindrance, Father, Lord, every tiredness, every lethargicness, Lord, every um, he, he, sickness in their body, any dead problem, Lord, lack of peace, we come against you in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray for an impartation of prayer, Lord, right now. Lord, you're calling many people, Lord. I see you pouring out, Lord, an uh, impartation right now, God. You're going to wake up people in the night season, Lord. You are calling people even today to stand in the gap and pray. You said, my people called after my name. If you humble yourself and seek my face, I will bring revival to the land. Lord, I thank you that you're raising up an army of revivalists, Lord God. The demon is going to run, Father, that is going to touch heaven and change earth. I thank you, Lord, for this powerful, powerful souls, Lord powerful people that are you going to use mightily in the last move of God. Father, right now I pray for those who need a financial breakthrough. Father, I pray for increase. I pray, Lord, today will be a day when they go back home, they will find a miracle financially. Those who need a healing in their body, somebody has an elbow pain in your right elbow and the Lord is touching you and healing you. Right now, in the name of Jesus, somebody has a pain in your spine. The Lord is touching you and healing you. Receive your healing in Jesus' name. There's somebody here who's having a problem in your voice box. You're not able to speak. You're, you've been having trouble even singing. Father, in the name of Jesus, we release the healing over their voice right now. In the name of Jesus, there's somebody here. You've been having, somebody has given you a plan. And you've been struggling with this plan to make it happen. The Lord is saying, just rest in me. Just rest in me. I will go before you and make the crooked. God, we continue to, to to continue in a prayer with Dr. Edith right now, dear God, just for these students. We ask you, dear God, for your anointing just to rule and to rest and, and to continue to pour out your blessings. We step beyond, and we know that as, as your spirit is in the midst of us, that you connect us and you, you begin to bond us, dear God. And we ask you, dear God, for your blessings to continue to flow through and to continue in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen.